Uh, Dr. Bardonia earned his bachelor's degree and PhD degrees from the University of Pennsylvania and the SM degree from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. After receiving his PhD from Penn, he joined our faculty as an assistant professor in 1964. He went on to become the director of the Moore School of Electrical Engineering, and then an associate dean. And then finally, he was the dean of the school from 1981 through 1990. From 1991 to 2005, Dr. Bardonia served at the US National Science Foundation, first as a director of engineering, the engineering directorate, and then he was appointed the deputy director and the chief operating officer at the National Science Foundation. Dr. Bredonia, or Joe, as we know him, meant a lot to us, uh, to Penn, to Penn Engineering. But really, it's his dedication and his efforts to include underrepresented populations in science, technology, engineering, and math education that we honor today. And we recognize him as one of the pioneers in this field. And I'll mention two of his many, many initiatives, both related to this very central mission that uh, we're, we're, we're uh, focusing on today. He founded Prime Philadelphia Regional Introduction for Minorities to Engineering. And he did this in 1973. He was a man well ahead of his time, a program which ran for two decades, supporting integrative engineering and science learning programs for fifth through 12th grade students and teachers. The second achievement or second contribution I'll mention uh, was when he was Dean, he established Penn Engineering's Office of Minority Programs, now the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. And that was 40 years ago. And today we're extremely fortunate to have Dr. Barabino join us and speak at the second Joseph Perdonia Forum. Dr. Barabino is the president of Olin College of Engineering and professor of biomedical and chemical engineering. She previously served as Daniel and Francis Berg professor and dean at the City College of New York's CCNY Grove School of Engineering. And prior to joining CCNY, she was associate chair for graduate studies and professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Georgia Tech and Emory. At Georgia Tech, she also served as the inaugural vice provost for academic diversity. She's also a noted researcher in the area of cell cycle, sickle cell disease, cellular and tissue engineering, and the role of race and ethnicity and gender in science and engineering. She has many honors, as you can imagine, including an honorary degree from Xavier University of Louisiana, the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, and Engineering Mentoring, and so many others. Uh, Dr. Barabino is the president-elect of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS, which, as you all know, is the world's largest interdisciplinary scientific society. She's also a fellow of AAAS, fellow of the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, a fellow of the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering, and fellow of the Biomedical Engineering Society. Are there any other societies? <laughs> She's an elected member of the National Academy of Engineering, the National Academy of Medicine, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She chairs the National Academy's Committee on Women in Science, Engineering, and Medicine, and serves on numerous committees of the National Academies, including the Roundtable on Black Men and Black Women in Science, Engineering, and Medicine, and the Health and Medicine Division Committee. She's also a member of the Congressionally Mandated Committee on Equal Opportunities in Science and Engineering. Dr. Barabino consults nationally and internationally on STEM education and research, on diversity, equity, and inclusion in higher education, on on policy, faculty development, and workforce development. Gilda, we're so honored that you're able to take time off of your busy schedule to spend the day with us. I know being a president, you have lots of things on your plate and we do appreciate your joining us today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming President Barabino. Thank you, Vijay, for that kind introduction. And thank you for the invitation to be here. I have to tell you, I'm very honored and privileged to be here with you today. And um, I'm just thrilled to be able to be the second speaker 
uh, for this Bordonia form after John Slaughter, uh, someone who I know well and have followed his work and his work has actually influenced mine. You've heard a lot about Joe Bordonia and you, you know him from his uh, experience in this community. But what you might not know is he actually has a connection to Olin College of Engineering. So when Olin was being founded, Larry Miles, our founder, who was at the time heading up the Franklin W. Olin Foundation, spoke with Joe Bordonia. And at the time, Joe was at NSF as the deputy director and COO. They had a conversation about what was needed to transform engineering education. They talked about the need for being more team-based, project-based, and problem-based in learning. And Larry Miles was taken with that. He also felt like the way to really make a change was to start from scratch and to have a clean slate. So part of how Olin got founded in 1997 was to create that clean slate to be transformative in engineering education. And I have to tell you, our community still remembers Joe Bordonia fondly. And when Olin started, there was a president's council that Joe served on. So making that connection is really uh, important as well. I'm just looking for my arrows that are not working for me right now. Now, here we go. So I wanna tell you a little bit about how I framed this presentation for you today. I'm talking through my lived experiences. I'm also talking through the kinds of work that I've known and understand through the literature, how I synthesized it and how I contributed to that literature. And I'm also talking to you from a status of it's time for us to think about change and facing what it is we're dealing with. So I'm sharing with you a quote from one of my favorite authors, James Baldwin. And what he's saying is that not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. And I wanna share with you a few things that I'm involved in uh, nationally and some efforts that are happening at the National Academies level. I think you know there's a national reckoning within our country looking at anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So this was a summit that I co-chaired with uh, Keith Yamamoto and in this summit, we were specifically addressing diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism in STEM and medicine organizations. Part of the impetus was this, for this was a letter that was from Eddie Bernice Johnson, from a Congresswoman who heads up science policy. And she talked about the need for us as a country, as a nation, to work on this issue and for the National Academies to have a leadership role in that. The White House, OSTP, also has initiative in this area, and they have an area that they call the time is now. They're having a number of national conversations and, uh, through this roundtable, and our summit was the topic of one of those roundtable discussions with OSTP. Another activity that's forthcoming through the National Academies, and I want you all to be on the lookout for it, is a study that's specifically on anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion in STEM organizations. This study committee has just been formed. I'm co-chairing this committee with my co-chair, Susan Fisk, and we're gonna develop recommendations for actionable and anti-racism anti -racism mechanisms to advance DEI and STEM organizations. We'll also be addressing medicine as well. The idea that this consensus study is that we actually delve deeply into what are the issues, what are the questions we still need to answer, and what are some ways that we could move forward collectively as a nation? I mentioned that it's time for change. And some of the things that we should be thinking about is how do we define and commit to equity and inclusive excellence? How do we build cultures that are actually equity-minded? How do we use communicating our data as a tool to advance equity? And one way for you to think about using data as a tool is to collect the data in the first place and to be transparent with the data that you collect and to disaggregate that data so that we can see trends according to race, ethnicity, gender, and other identities. We need to align those with our strategic priorities 
and we need to help build capacity. So I want to talk to you about some assumptions that I think we need to challenge. I think it's very important for us to think about what some of those assumptions are that have been guiding how we operate. And if we don't challenge them, we won't see the change that we're looking for. One is that we presume that there's a shortage of talent. Another is that we presume that we actually operate in a meritocracy. And we particularly assume that when we're working in scientific fields where there's this assumption that there's some inherent objectivity. And we also assume that we do have diversity, equity, and inclusion. But if we look around and hold a mirror to ourselves and reflect, do we actually reflect the population that we are serving? So I'm gonna posit that it is not an, that we don't have enough talent. We have an inequity and an opportunity. It's true that there are challenges, but actually the early interest in STEM for those from underrepresented groups is equal to that from those who are not from underrepresented groups. And here's a statistic that was reported in USA Today that two times the black graduates with computer science degrees are out there as those that are being hired. And that if we look at data recently reported by the American Society of Engineering and Education, engineering faculty of color represent just two to three percent of the black faculty represent just two to three percent of the total faculty. And I want to end with something to really think about is a quote from Don Slaughter. And no one says it as eloquently and forcefully and compellingly as John Slaughter. The real issue is that we need to let opportunity meet the talent. You may have noticed in the literature, and if you haven't in the news, I wanna share with you some other um, data and background, this concept of the missing Einsteins and missing millions. So this is a group at Harvard led by Raj Chetty, and they are part of the Equal Opportunity Project, and more details can be found on their website, opportunityinsights.org. But some of the data that they've been sharing nationally is that innovation in the U.S. could be four times higher if women and underrepresented minority from low-income families become inventors at the same rate as those uh, uh, men from wealthy families. They also spoke and were able to demonstrate that children from families in the top 1% of earners were 10 times more likely to be inventors than those from families in the bottom 50%. And in some of their data where they were looking at where inventors eventually come from, and they looked at data where they looked at third grade math and science scores and also family income. And their correlation, what they said was, you were more likely to become an inventor if you had high level scores in third grade math and science and you came from a rich family. And if you think about the kinds of segregation and the, and the disparities in how we have educational systems, you can understand how the color of someone's skin or their race and ethnicity and background and where they live actually might dictate there are possibilities and opportunities around invention and discovery. And this is some data that, uh, and statistics that have been shared by the National Science Board that in their estimation for the science and engineering workforce to be representative of the US population by 2030, the number of women must nearly double, the number of blacks must double, and the number of Latinx must triple. And another study I'd like to share with you about the diversity innovation paradox in science. And this was work that's re been reported in the proceedings of the National Academy of Science by Hofstra and his colleagues, that the, there's a conundrum of uh, gender and minoritized groups being more likely to innovate, but less likely to have that innovation lead to successful academic careers. And 
part of that explanation is a devaluation of minoritized individuals in their work as a likely reason. So one of the things that has been shown in the literature, there's this concept, I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's called epistemic exclusion. And what it says is that your scholarship may be devalued simply because it is coming from a person of color because you are being devalued as a person of color and the work that you are doing is being devalued as well. And I'm sharing that so that we can understand the background and the uh, foregrounding of some of the challenges that we face. Speaking of the inventor gender gap, all female inventor teams are 35% more likely than all male teams to focus on women's health. This is a study that's been reported in science by uh, Koenig and colleagues. And what part of what they um, talked about was that women were less likely to obtain patents. And in part is because women are less visible in the innovation system, less visible in the entrepreneurship system and ecosystem, less visible among the decision makers. And they also showed that this was a true pattern, similar pattern for people of color. So let's say a little bit more about this myth of meritocracy. Part of the problem with this assumption that if you simply work hard, you will be rewarded based on merit and that not being true is that it gives a false impression that advancement is solely based on merit. It also really disadvantages members of underrepresented groups. And it certainly exacerbates by growing these inequalities. And what are some of the factors? So one is because opportunity and access really aren't equal. Another, as I demonstrated from some of the work uh, from Chetty's group, is that family income and wealth certainly does play a factor. We have to think about the influences of race and gender as well. And now I'd like to move to, let's look at these areas through a lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And part of doing that would be to get a sense of what do we mean by diversity, equity, and inclusion? So let's start with diversity. There are quite a number of definitions. I'm gonna share some few that's been taken from the literature. So one way to approach diversity is that it's a fair representation of all different aspects of human characteristics, identities and perspectives, and the composition of groups. It could also be a measure of the complexity of the group. And it's one way of thinking about all aspects of human difference and what makes us unique. Way to define. How about a way to conceptualize diversity? I think it's important for us when we're thinking about diversity is to view it at, not in isolation, but as part of a complex system. For example, see the connection between having diversity in the student body and diversity in the faculty. It's often true that having diverse students can help you attract diverse faculty and having di diverse faculty will be an attraction for diverse students. And also it's important when we have that level of diversity, if we think about the quality of the interactions between faculty and students, and it's not just representational, it's also the quality of the interactions, which is sometimes referred to as interactional diversity. We need to think about the institutionalization of policy and programs to enhance diversity. And by that, I mean, we have to go further than what are those policies that we use when we admit to what are the policies and practices that we use to help retain and to ensure progression along a career path that's successful for all. And I think we need to recognize that excellence is not the same as diversity. And actually what you need to think about is diversity and excellence as being inextricably linked. Equity. One way to define equity is that it's support provided to individuals according to need for access, opportunity, and advancement. 
a further conceptualization of equity is that we have an equitable distribution of opportunities. And that we think about inclusion, but inclusion that's just and fair. And of course, thinking about how we match the needs to the resources. Let's say more about inclusion. One way to define inclusion is as the acknowledged impactful participation and contribution to the benefit of the individual and the organization. And conceptualizing inclusion. I like this diagram that's been put out by the Catalyst Organization because it speaks to the idea that if we're gonna truly have inclusion, we need belongingness and uniqueness. By nature, we as humans want to belong, but we also want to be valued for our uniqueness. So it's that combination of having that sense of belonging, but also being able to be seen and recognized and valued for who you are uniquely as a member of that group. That's what we mean by conceptualizing inclusion. And I'll share with you this quote from Berkeley's Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society. Belonging or being fully human means more than having access. It means having a meaningful voice and being afforded the opportunity to participate in the design of social and cultural structures. Belonging entails being respected at a basic level that includes the right to both contribute to and make the demands upon society and political institutions. A little bit more about inclusive excellence. We will make sure that in our environments, we are supportive of and include women and underrepresented minorities in collaborations, leadership and scientific discourse. Sometimes it's as simple as being included in the scientific conversation. I've talked to students and sometimes I hear from them that one way that they would like to be included in a lab group, for example, is just to be included in the scientific conversation. Could you ask me a question about my research instead of just asking me about the weather? If I am the member of the lab group who has expertise in a certain area and you come in and you ask everybody about that except me, that is not a way to actually feel included. So that's something that we should think about and who's reflected in our leadership as well. And I want to impress upon you this concept of science being social. I mentioned earlier that when we are in technical fields, we tend to feel like not us, we're separate from social science. Why would you talk about diversity, equity, inclusion in the engineering context? It's because we are people doing engineering for people. We are scientists doing science for people. Science is social. And think about the culture of science. Social scientists who study us, <laughs> they talk about the fact that science is socially constructed. It's social and organizational. It's a social process. It's a system of communication, interaction, and exchange. So how we conduct ourselves and how we create conditions and environments for inclusivity or not says a lot about our culture. It says a lot about who gets to be a scientist, who decides what the scientific questions are, and then who will become scientists. So we can't escape the fact that social factors influence who participates and who has status. And I wanna say something specifically about the high costs that we have when we have sexism and racism, racism and not to mention when they're intertwined. Many speak of an emotional tax. And if you speak to faculty of color in particular, who have been in settings where not only they're expected to do their scholarship and do it well, they're expected to hold up their institutions and organizations around supporting other people of color, around helping their institution carry out the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion. That can take a toll. We also have this, this sense of if you are literally discriminated against or made to feel like you don't belong based on uh, race or gender or other forms of identity, that takes a toll. 
you don't have the same opportunities for growth. The isolation and marginalization and exclusion that's related to stereotypes and other structural impediments can become overwhelming. And we certainly are leaving untapped talent at the table. And it absolutely contributes to this persistent underrepresentation that we see. So I wanna talk about some ways that I think we can make shifts in our thinking and in the way we create conditions within our culture and our environments. Too often we are thinking of a deficit, deficit uh, mindset. And we also think about people who don't fit in the norm as having a deficit. We need to be more asset-based asset and equity-minded. And we need to think about the inequalities and status and the recognition of the resources and who has access to the, the resources and move to a situation where if it's not equitable, that we make it equitable. We make those needs match the resources and we bring the opportunity to the talent as John Slaughter would say. And we certainly will look at ourselves proactively and intentionally about ways that we actually create conditions that foster exclusion so that we have inclusive and collaborative environments. Collaboration is key. And you'll hear me say more about collaboration and how we can collaborate both in academic curricular settings as well as research and outside the classroom settings. And I, I like to really point out the importance of empowerment. If we're really doing our job, we are empowering others, empowering students, empowering faculty and other members of the community. The sense of self agency and a sense of purpose for us as individuals as members of a collective actually goes a long way. So how do we break this mold? Recognition is really important. I've done some work uh, with some social scientists around identity formation. And part of what that work says for us to be able to see ourselves as a scientist or engineer and develop that identity, professionally in particular, we need to be recognized by those who are already seen as scientists and um, engineers. We need to recognize quality work wherever it shows up. We need to restructure our environments, as I was mentioning, that create those kinds of conditions where people feel part of the system and as uh, valuable contributors. We need to think about cultural confidence. So it is not enough for us to expect those who are from different backgrounds to educate us, we should educate ourselves. And we should also use that education in ways to be enlightened so that we are better understanding of one another and where our backgrounds are and what the things that we have in common. You'll hear this often, but there, it is true. There's so much more that we have in common than different. And I'm finding that sharing those common interests and coming together around common goals really does help bring people together and break down barriers. We need to understand lived experiences and their impact on learning and behaviors. So it's very easy for us to see the world through our own lived experiences. And that's why I shared with you at the outset that I'm telling you what I'm sharing with you today is through my lived experience as a black woman. But I do recognize that everyone's lived experience is not the same as mine. And we need to be open to understanding each other's lived experiences. And I wanna share with you some of the lessons that I learned about socialization. And some of this is coming from a study that I did with a social science colleague, Cheryl Lagon, who's a uh, sociologist and, and specializes in public policy. So we did a study where we actually followed women of color, academics and engineering for three years, looking at their career progression and thinking about factors that influence career progression. So not only did we do this research study, we also did professional development activities for them. And it wouldn't surprise you, the importance of mentors, sponsors, and champions, the importance of what we're calling communalism, community, community building, and creating a sense of belonging. So part of what the women in this cohort told us 
was that they felt this sense of community amongst each other. They were from different schools across the nation, but were able to come together as a group of women of color experiencing um, all sorts of issues within the academy as women of color. And we talked about the importance of contextual and longitudinal data, again, disaggregated by race, ethnicity, and gender. And the reason why I harp on that a bit, because if we don't disaggregate that data, what happens? The experiences of certain groups become invisible because we don't acknowledge their presence. We say things like, well, there's so few, so we're just not gonna count that data. But by doing that, we render them and their experiences invisible. And I'll share with you a few things, again, lessons learned around promoting career advancements. And I'm talking specifically about engineering because that's my own experience. The socialization aspects and that we, the need for professional development and leadership development, the recognition that I mentioned earlier. But I also think we need new models and styles of mentoring and advocacy. So think about graduate education, for example. It's been the same forever. We have this model where you have a thesis advisor and you'll have a thesis committee, but your trajectory and whether you get out and how timely you get out, a lot of that is determined specifically by the thesis advisor. When it works well, it's great. When it doesn't work well, it's a disaster. And who bears the brunt of it? The student. And so I think we need to think more broadly about that and think about are there other models? Are there more collective models? Can we have? more of a group um, doing advising? How do we do advocacy? I'll say one other thing about advocacy. We as scientists and engineers need to know and understand a lot more about policy and the impacts of the policies on what we do. And I'll give you an example. One of my graduate students while I was at Georgia Tech, she was a graduate student getting a PhD in biomedical engineering, but she did a, a certificate in public policy. And that was a huge experience for her what she said to me, like many of her peers said to her, you are so lucky that your thesis advisor is even allowing you the opportunity to study something outside of the lab, like policy. And that one student said to her, I wanted to do that, but my thesis advisor said to me, no way, you're not getting out of this lab. We have to be open to these other areas and ways for our students to gain experiences. And they're not all limited to the lab. We need to think about how we have reward and recognition systems. And I think we need to think about the restructured environments, as I mentioned. So how do we promote diversity, equity, and inclusion more? I want to bring up this concept of authenticity of the message. By that, I mean, listen to and learn from those who are most impacted. There's nothing worse than a group of folks getting in a room and saying, I know what you need and I'm gonna come up with a solution for you, but I'm not gonna involve you in that conversation of what the solution would be. So that other piece of it is like believing that lived experience that could be different from our own and being open to dialogue, but not just talk. We have to have action that follows that and equitable adherence to our policies, recognize contributions. It should be that we, are, we will give just as much weight and value to contributions around diversity, equity, and inclusion as we would to a research contribution. Because without that and having a broader development of talent, we're not gonna have the best research anyway. I think we need to take a proactive stance on righting wrongs, because many times what you'll hear, particularly those who are, are most impacted, that they do bring up the issues, but nothing happens about it. Like no one's actually trying to right the wrong. And we should not penalize those who are most impacted. So it's so, sort of like penalizing the messenger, but we should not penalize those who are the least served. And those who have voice and privilege should use it in ways can, that can help others who are less privileged in particular. I mentioned earlier, and I'm just gonna emphasize it again, you'll see some things that I repeat, but it, because, it is because I think they bear repeating about a sense of belonging and socialization. And I'm gonna end this part with thinking about leadership intentionality and accountability. We need leaders who are courageous, 
and unapologetic about standing up for diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism. We need intentionality. We can't just wait for things to happen. And we need to be accountable. And we need to hold ourselves accountable. So what are some models for excellence in engineering through a DEI lens? Now what I'd like to do is share some specific work that's going on at Olin and give you an idea of how we think we are actually building inclusive models by incorporating diversity, equity, and inclusion. And with these examples, invite you to think about how you might use some of that, because I also think it's really important, the context that we're in. You'll hear people talk about, well, just get a best practice and scale it. I don't think it's that simple. We are in different contextual settings, but we can take aspects of a particular approach or strategy or um, way of doing something that might work in our own context. Engage with Olin. We have a website that we actually share many of these examples that I'm sharing, sharing with you now so that others in the broader community may find something in there that's useful to them. And one course that I'm gonna talk about, this is a course, it's called Engineering for Humanity. What I love about this course, one of the lead instructors is an anthropologist. And in this particular course, they were working specifically with members of the senior, uh, well, they're senior citizens, but I, I'm gonna be careful with how I describe our senior citizens. But th these are people who may have some specific needs around aging and the students are working directly with them to do problem solving so that these seniors that they're working with are their clients but they're engaging them in the design process so they work alongside them and they interview them and they talk with them and they they look at where they're living and how they're living to see what their unmet needs are and how they might design for those unmet needs and they're very empathetic in their work and they are using ethnographic techniques so they're learning a lot that's embedded in their engineering uh, course. There's another course that's called Affordable Design and Entrepreneurship. And in this course, it's a combination of entrepreneurial work, social entrepreneurship, along with design. It's very experiential. The, we have projects across the world, but the students are very much working on a, a group with the low resources and they have unmet needs that their students are then working with them to design a project that will help meet that unmet need. And we love it because it's such a great way to mix this idea of having public good and using engineering principles towards this societal uh, impact and in a social venture. Another concept that we talk about is design refusal. So one of the things that we're trying to impart on the students as part of their engineering education is to use engineering responsibly, ethically. So what good is it if we have these technologies, these tools and techniques, and we're not responsible in their use? So this is this case where the students are actually evaluating their community engagement projects. And they are deciding for themselves how responsible they are in, in their use of technology. And the reason why they talk about it is design refusal, because if this, the project doesn't meet that uh, set of criteria, then the students won't do the project. They will refuse. And that I think is a good learning for them in terms of how to be responsible engineers. And now I want to say some things generally some learnings around how do we attract marginalized groups to engineering and part of it i think is relevance people need to see the relevance of our field to their world to their everyday lives so we may need some structural changes to do things like be able to use engineering to solve real world problems and address those problems in our curriculum we need to think about the equity ethic we are drawing students now who are coming to us looking for us to be equitable and responsible. And they themselves are feeling the need to have equity within society. So that ethic is a draw. Also, many 
are very much driven by this desire to get back to their own community. So this sense of a communal goal, like altruistic, like you really want to give back. And I'll give you an example from my own career. One of the reasons why I decided to study sickle cell disease as a graduate student is because I wanted a project that would allow me to give back to my community. I wanted a project also that allowed me to use engineering principles to solve a problem in medicine. I saw a way to do that by using engineering principles to look at the abnormal blood flow and sickle cell disease. And I engaged specifically with members of the sickle cell community, individuals living with the disease, families, clinicians, and others. And I do believe that there are others who are similarly drawn to our field. Many times we miss out because people don't know and see the connection that they actually can meet their goals through a, our field like science, technology, and engineering. So this opportunity to solve complex problems facing humanity is really universal regardless of background. You don't have to be from an underserved group to want to make society better. And then I want to share this quote with you. Many of you probably are familiar with the work of Scott Page. He's talked a lot about the diversity differences and how that when we have diverse groups, we have better results. So this is a quote from one of his papers that a diverse group almost always outperforms the group of the best by a substantial margin. And I'm gonna leave you with this concept. Wouldn't it be great if we actually did realize engineering for everyone. So with that, I'm gonna conclude my formal remarks and I really would love it if we could actually engage in some discussion. Thank you so much. Yeah, so if I understand the question right, you're saying we have underrepresented minorities, some of whom are low resourced as well. And we have some who are not necessarily low resource. And, right, so, okay, so I have a couple of responses to that. In the society that we're in, if you present and are a person of color, under, historically underrepresented, you may have challenges anyway, whether you have resources or not, because there's, there's a level of, systemic racism and, and unfairness in our system. So that's one piece of it. So I'm just gonna put that out there. But to your bigger question about, and I think this is not just related to underrepresented minorities either, matching resources with need. So the question really is, how do you get to the resources to those who really need them? And I think some of that is that we just have to do more work around understanding what the needs are and who has the needs and then create and be willing to differentiate and say, we're gonna put those resources where the needs are greatest. And many times people have a hard time making those decisions and just say, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna have intentionality around this and this is what we need to do. I think part of what we could do too, especially those of us who are in higher education is to partner with and understand what's happening in the pathway earlier on. So part of like matching those resources with the needs is reaching people earlier before the 
gaps, the equity gaps and the need for even more resources gets bigger and bigger. And so it does take more work. It takes more of like, how do you actually find out the information and use that information? I think that's one part of it, but it's, it's a complex thing and it's really important. And I think we definitely have to pay attention to where the resources are needed the most, especially when we have limited resources. So if you're not limited in your resources, fine, spread it all out. So some of what I'm saying needs to happen too is being able to make the difficult decisions around how you meter out the resources that you do have. Sure. How can PhD programs like Oh, well, I love that. How can PhD programs since PhD students like right help colleges like mine, like all of especially it's really important too because we're small and we're undergraduate. And what I think, and what I'm actually pushing at Olin right now is that part of how we will expand and have our impact is through partnership and partnership with a school like Penn. <laughs> because what we could do is just think of how exciting it would be to have our undergraduates work with your graduate students and vice versa. We could learn from one another. We could say, here's how you can use this model in your setting. Here are the things that you can take from it. What could we do together? <clears throat> Excuse me, we could do things like, we're gonna go out into the community and we're gonna go out into the community together. And this is what that would look like. It would enrich graduate studies as well as undergraduate studies. So I do push back and think a lot about on the applications, the real world applications and meeting needs. I think about where we're located. I think about where you're located. I think about the responsibility of institutions of higher learning to the communities that they reside in and to the communities more broadly. So if we said we had a shared purpose around impacting these communities and the communities that need the resources the most, and we're gonna to come together to do that. And we're gonna invite that community in, what's your need and how can we help you meet that need? And I'm gonna pay attention to you. So when I have a position open that you are now steeped and this culture and this environment and these shared goals and you want to join my institution, I think that's great. Who's that person who asked that question? It's great. <laughs> yes, so the question is, if it's so important for us to restructure environments, what might that look like in various settings? And the reason why I talk about context is because I think what works in one setting might not necessarily work in another. When I think about an environment that should be inclusive, I talk about lived experiences. I think about when I walk in a space and I immediately scope it out, what, what I need, and what would others like me need to feel included? One of the first things, I need to see someone who looks like me. Like I have learned, especially because I've had so much in my career has been a solo status, that I walk in a room and I immediately do a read, immediately. So I think some of it is that it's representational. Some of it is that you create spaces where people can speak and their opinions be heard and not be shut down. And some of that we have to work on to make sure that we let voices be heard. And one way that I think is really important that we can start to achieve these things is when we work on things together. I constantly see that the idea of working on some shared problem together is a way to bring people together because then they see, I have something that I can contribute to this project and it, the shared goals. But the environments, we have to create the conditions for that to happen. So, so I'll give you some examples from Olin around creating conditions and structures. I think part of why the collaboration is as, is as strong as it is, is because it started out without departmental silos, 
it started out with interdisciplinarity as a focus and it was like something that was really critical where you're not fighting with people to say, can I get credit? It's interdisciplinary, you know? People say they work across disciplines, it's important, and then fight over who gets the credit. So, you know, you all know what I'm talking about. So I, <laughs> so I think it's those kinds of things. So it's also practices and, and policies. It's how we recognize work and how we value work that helps structure our environment. And also some of it actually is physical. There are physical things, how we're co-located, how we might create open spaces where we just bump into one another, as opposed to everybody being behind closed doors. That's how, why in some places, I don't know how widely it's done here at Penn, but people started talking about neighborhood labs, where instead of having so many labs set up where it's just to an individual investigator and it's just that, but to have more where you just spread out, blur the lines, blur the boundaries. I think that's part of restructuring environments. A question on Zoom for you. Sure. Um, this is about the role of the historical context of engineering excellence in black, brown, indigenous, and poor communities in our work to center DEI in engineering and engineering education. It's somebody from Atlanta that thinks that you might bring some unique uh, insights from your times at uh, Emory College. So the, uh, so I'm not sure if I understood the question I, right. This, I'm just reading aloud here. Okay. It's a historical context of engineering excellence in various communities. Uh, so what, what is the, what is, how does that inform our work today on DEI and engineering and engineering education? So the historical context of underrepresented communities? Yes. And how does that impact uh, work in DEI? Yes. So I think about the historical context of people of color and indigenous communities in the context of their experience, historical experience with science and engineering and technology, the idea of being excluded and not necessarily having their stories told and their contributions known. Think about how many inventors who may be people of color that we don't even know about. Think about how we have these stereotypes and ideas in our heads of what an inventor looks like or what a scientist looks like for that matter. So I think part of what we should be thinking about as we work forward, one is knowing and understanding the history to accurately give credit to and recognize those who have been contributors and to make sure that as we go forward, we're inclusive and thinking about who and how we recognize good work and what we call good work. I actually was appalled when I started looking myself and trying to get a better understanding of the contributions of black and brown and others in science or even how science has been used to justify inequities or to justify racism. So if we're gonna be responsible scientists as we move forward, we make sure that we hold ourselves to the truth. I, I was talking to one social scientist who talked about intellectual honesty in our scholarship. So I think those are some of the things that we have to think about as, as we work um, in what we're doing now. And also the idea, some people feel like you can't introduce social science or history into an engineering or technical course because then you're diluting the, the technical component. You're actually enriching it if we can tie that to the social connection and people can understand and see themselves in the science. If I could just uh, use my privilege as a moderator <laughs> to ask you a question. I, I was intrigued by your definition on inclusion and that was the only equation in your talk. You <laughs> said uh, belongingness plus uniqueness equals yes. inclusion. Yes. And it just strikes me that, um, so first I, I, I saw it and I said, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. Then I started wondering about the terms because belongingness is one thing. Right. Um, and at the same time, making somebody feel unique right. uh, is quite another thing. Right. And I just uh, wondered how, if you have a practical example of how you operationalize this at, uh, at Olin. Sure. So the question is, I, I have a microphone. You don't have to. Repeat okay, great. <laughs> so how do we make this compute belongingness plus uniqueness 
equals inclusion. So one of the things that ways that I feel like we do that at Olin is to really meet individuals where they are and really understand who they are and allow them to bring all of their identities to Olin. So the idea is like, you come here, you can be seen as an engineer regardless of what your identities are and you don't have to check them at the door. Because in some places you feel like to be seen as or accepted as an engineer, you have to downplay an identity or, or say, you know, you don't think that's important. We are so into thinking and learning about the students so even at the admissions process, it is so involved to look at and understand the student holistically. Even in our admissions process, we have students participate in our storytelling exercises so that we can learn more about them. And we do that the entire time they're there. But part of this being able to be who you are as a part of the group helps have both the belongingness and the uniqueness. And so, Part, and it could be sometimes there's some self-selection too, because people will come to Olin and say, I can see myself here because I will be able to do the things that are different. I can have more flexibility. I can go after social justice and still be seen as an engineer. So I think that's part of how we try to bring it all together. Really enjoyed your, really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. One thing that we had learned in the immediate pandemic, the last two years, is that getting the vaccine was one thing because you know op optimism of it changing, you know, normalizing the society. But we needed enough people to buy in. People needed to get vaccinated in order for that vaccine to take an effect. Similarly, for the kind of um, outlook that you presented, changing the culture. Uh, around diversity, equity, and inclusion um, is about getting the right policies, but it also is about getting a majority to buy in into that culture. How do you think about that um, in your uh, position at Olin? Yeah, absolutely. So the question is like, how do you get the buy-in and how do you go about like bringing people in and getting like large amounts of buy-in? I really do believe in working with your early adopters, working with those who already are there and marshalling them to do more and then bring others along as you go. So you don't start out saying, you know what? I'm not gonna do anything until I get everybody on board because you might not go anywhere. Mm -hmm. so, so I do really feel strongly about working together. And we do this on, in teams when we, all of us, when we are working on different projects, and you start to bring in, what happens is you actually start to influence by adding on, adding on, adding on. And before you know it, it is more part of what people do see and think. Uh, and it, it, is, it becomes more pervasive. I also think we need leadership. We need top down and bottom up, both. And I really believe it in doing. So one of the things that I push at Olin and one of the first things I said there was that we were going to do strategic doing. Think about it. Engineers, we do. We learn by doing. So having people actually do what it is we are reaching for is one way to, to get the buy-in as we go. Thank yeah. you for that question. I wanted to thank you for your presentation, sure. your amazing talk and the discussion. I want to also present you with a small token of our appreciation. This is a plaque, and let me just read what it says. The Joseph Fredonia Forum presented with deep appreciation to Dilda A. Barbino, February 15th, 2022. Thank you Thank so much. You. Thank you.